So good morning everyone and welcome to the final live, well it's now pre-recorded due to technical issues but that's another story, of Lupus Awareness Month um, 2020. Today I am delighted to have Dr Joel David with us who's a rheumatologist and has kindly given up his Saturday morning to answer questions on all things lupus. So thank you everyone who submitted questions. We've got a wide range of topics from diagnosis, flares, treatments, diets. Um, so let's get started. So what is a rheumatologist? Morning, Vicky. Thank you for asking me to, to join you. No problem. Uh, it's a great pleasure. So a rheumatologist is a general physician who's um, got expertise in the management and the treatment and investigation of inflammatory, usually inflammatory, musculoskeletal disease. So diseases involving muscles, joints, tendons, ligaments. Many rheumatologists specialize in different areas. So for example, I look after people who are in transition, in other words, from the ages of 16 to 19, but I also look after the autoimmune connective tissue diseases, such as lupus, scleroderma. Other rheumatologists may specialize in back pain or knee pain, etc., uh, vasculitis, ankylosing spondylitis. So, you know, it's a, there are, it's a quite a big specialty, multidisciplinary, often involving other special specialists, such as heart, lung, kidneys, um, but my area is the autoimmune connective tissue diseases. Which is why you're here today. Uh -huh. So what causes lupus? So that's a big question and it's a difficult one and uh, to be frank we still don't know. But we know that genetics are important. In other words, there's a much higher incidence of autoimmune diseases in families. So it's not uncommon to have a family member with either rheumatoid or thyroid disease or vitamin B12 related anemia, etc. So genetics play a part. Viruses may precipitate it. Stress may precipitate it. Often there may be complement or protein deficiencies. So it's a multifactorial cause. Sometimes it's like a perfect storm. So you have the right genetics, a viral insult, significant stress such as a bereavement, and then it starts. From there. So what are the steps of getting diagnosed? Because I know that there's no one test that says, yes, you have lupus or no, you don't. So Yeah, that's right. So it can be really difficult. Um, and lupus is a diagnosis that's often made on the basis of what we call diagnostic criteria. So you need to have the presence of four, say, out of 11 potential criteria being present in order to make a definite diagnosis of lupus. If less than four are present, then we might call it possible lupus or a connective to tissue disease in evolution. So it's, there isn't one single diagnostic test which says, right, that's lupus. Some tests are more um, specific than others. So say, for example, the presence of SM antibodies is highly suggestive and highly specific, but in itself is not enough to make a diagnosis. Which is probably why it takes so long to get that final diagnosis. Or well, it might be. Um, it might be very quick. So you might have a, a, a young person who presents with um, uh, a rash, kidney disease, positive blood tests, uh, joint pain, and they have one blood test and within the day they're diagnosed with lupus. But then you can get other people who might have very low level symptoms such as joint pain, fatigue, dry eyes, and it can be ages before the diagnosis is made. So can a person have lupus even though the blood tests show negative ESR and negative CRP? So the ESR and the CRP are markers of inflammation. Um, in fact, very often in active lupus, the CRP is normal. CRP is a measure of inflammation which is very useful if you've got infection present or if you've got, say, rheumatoid arthritis or vasculitis. But in active, um, good-going lupus, the CRP may be normal anyway. The ESR is a, um, a measure of inflammation which is due to the amount of protein in the blood. 
Um, so yes, it is conceivable you could have lupus um, that could be active with normal inflammatory markers. But there are other inflammatory markers that we would use to make a diagnosis of lupus, such as a high immunoglobulin level or um, um, a low white count, a low complement level. Fantastic. So how can we differentiate between lupus and other autoimmune disorders with overlapping symptoms? Mm, it can be difficult. So you could have, for example, um, a patient who's got joint pain with some erosive damage in their joints, but also got lupus blood tests and say a butterfly rash. You might call them rupus, which is a combination of rheumatoid and lupus. Or you might have a patient who's got dry eyes, dry mouth, um, in other words, a Sjogren's picture, but also with lupus. So it very much depends on what the predominant features are, on how you label it, and also how you treat it. Okay. If the patient has got a, some features of scleroderma, you might say that they're an overlap with scleroderma, or likewise with myositis, muscle inflammation. Okay. So lupus can also evolve <laughs> during time. So, um, for example, you might have a 20-year-old who will present with um, classic lupus, um, hair loss, butterfly rash, chest pain, blood tests that are very highly, you know, suggestive. But then as they get older, um, they may become more dryness of the eyes and the mouth and joint pains and sort of morph, morph into a sort of Sjogren's picture. Okay. And then when they get older, they might even become more rheumatoid. So it's, it's very much an evolutionary thing. And the job of the rheumatologist is always to evaluate what's the big, what's the big problem here? What are we dealing with? What, what, what do we need to treat? Sometimes with lupus, you don't need to treat everything. And that's also important. You need the skill of the clinician in partnership with the patient to actually say, actually, this is my big problem at the moment. The other thing to remember is that, you know, there isn't a treatment for everything. Yeah. You know, so sometimes we can't treat everything. So can you tell us more about the early lupus designation, please? Yes. Um, uh, not everyone uses that term. Um, so I would, when you say early lupus, I would think of that as basically having incomplete criteria to make a definitive diagnosis. If there's enough criteria to make a definite diagnosis, then I don't think calling it early lupus is helpful. I think it's either lupus or it's not lupus. But I think what you mean by early lupus is probably incomplete criteria. So, for example, maybe Raynaud's phenomenon, a rash, some hair loss and fatigue, but not enough actually hard criteria. We can also differentiate soft lupus symptoms with hard lupus symptoms. So a soft symptom might be fatigue, um, unwellness, which you can have due to lots of things. That's a soft sign. Whereas, say, um, blood and protein in the urine and high blood pressure are hard signs. That's definite disease. Yeah, thank you. So why is it that we can feel awful with lupus, but the blood tests are coming back at good levels? Why is that? Well, there's lots of reasons to feel awful, particularly, you know, at the moment. So um, fatigue can make you awful, uh, feel awful. Um, sleep deficiency. Um, Drugs can make you feel unwell. Um, stress, anemia, hypothyroidism. Um, these are all very, these are all lots of things that can happen at the same time, which can make you feel unwell, but not at all be related to activity of inflammation. So that's why it's really important when you're telling your doctor um, you, that you might think you're having a flare to actually try and dissect out and differentiate what's really going on. So the severity of symptoms does not always correlate with the severity of disease and the need for treatment. Is but that doesn't mean that they're less important symptoms. Yeah. They can be really, really suffering, but not necessarily due to the inflammatory side of your lupus. That actually makes sense when you put it like that, yeah. 
So what treatments are there for lupus? Um, so whenever you think about treatment, it's important to think about the whole algorithm or the whole range. So on the one end, you've got symptomatic treatments. So you've got painkillers, the normal things, paracetamol, uh, ibuprofen, etc. cetera, um, uh, skin treatments um, to prevent, you know, for, to sunscreens, all those sorts of things, um, vitamins to make you feel better. So that, at that end, and then you've got the immune modulatory treatments, which would include things like, say, hydroxychloroquine, um, antimalarials, um, methotrexate as a thiopreme, moving on to the more potent anti rheumatic or immunomodulatory treatments, mycophenolate, uh, cyclophosphamide, obviously steroids through the range. And then at the other end, you've got biological treatments, rituximab, plasma exchange, uh, um, major immunosuppressive treatments. So with these treatments, there's obviously going to be side effects because there's side effects with quite a lot of treatments. But yeah. could it be that the treatments are actually making the lupus worse? So whenever you think about a treatment, you always have to balance potential benefit against potential risk. And it's always important that when you start the treatment, you um, make sure that the potential benefit is greater than the risk. Um, if it's not, then the treatment is not, should not be used. Uh, but it's also true that every single treatment has a potential side effect. But the side effects may not necessarily occur in everybody. So say, for example, methotrexate, which is a not uncommon drug to be used in lupus and in rheumatoid, 5% um, of people will not be able to tolerate it because of a side effect. 10% will probably have a side effect which is manageable by some adjustment, either the dosage or the time of time of taking or addition of folic acid, etc. So um, it depends. So yes, all drugs do have side effects, but it, you know, with life and with all treatments, it's a balance. Definitely. So the well, job, the, sorry, the job of the clinician is to minimise the side effects. So to say, for example, with steroids, um, if they are indicated, then the clinician will almost always use them with some gastro protection, some bone protection, and try and use the lowest dose possible. Fantastic. So when is chemotherapy needed in lupus? I'm hearing more and more that people are taking chemo drugs with lupus. At what point does that come the best option? Yeah, so probably nowadays slightly earlier than it used to be. Um, and that's because we know more now that steroids are not good treatments. In the, you know, 20 years ago, steroids were used much, much more than they are now. But, you know, we don't like the toxicity from steroids. It, it, it suppresses your immune system, it makes you put on weight, gives you thin skin, cataracts, blah, blah, blah. So you don't really want to use steroids if you can possibly help it. So drugs such as methotrexate, azathioprine, mycophenolate are introduced rather earlier than they were before. But if you were to ask me what are the absolute indications for the use of those immunosuppressible chemotherapy type drugs, incidentally, I don't tend to use the word chemotherapy. I would say they're immunomodulatory treatments. Because okay. chemotherapy conjures up cancer and stuff. Yeah. Um, so I would tend to use those drugs if there was re kidney disease, if there was heart disease, bad lung disease, um, so major organ involvement. Okay, fantastic. So will a lupus patient ever get to the point where they can come off all their medication altogether? Um, it's possible. So sometimes lupus can be what we call a monophasic illness will be very, very severe in the beginning. Say the patient, the young patient might present with cerebral lupus, almost unconscious or with very bad neurological symptoms and maybe kidney inflammation. And you treat that really aggressively and then they go into remission and then they can gradually wean. And I've had many people, particularly adolescents, who presented aggressively in the beginning and then they are able to wean off treatment um, in time. It's not uncommon though for most people with, with sort of definite lupus to be on some form of treatment for a long period.
So how often should lupus patients get checkups by a rheumatologist? So it really, really depends on what's wrong with them. Okay. If you've got a, a patient um, who is um, largely in remission with just a few aches and pains, blood tests are relatively quiet, maybe some dry eyes and dry mouth, it would be perfectly all right for them to be seen annually. Whereas if you've got a, a patient who's got very aggressive disease, high blood pressure, bad kidney involvement, bad lung involvement or heart disease, you might be seeing them every week or, or, or every you, you know, every month or every three months. It really, really, do, the, the time interval of between appointments is very much dictated by the severity of the, of the disease at the time. Which makes sense, doesn't it? Hmm. So what should be reported to a rheumatologist and what should be reported to a GP, sort of symptoms wise? Um, I don't think it's helpful necessarily to differentiate. I mean, obviously, if it's unrelated to the lupus, then you'd mention it to your GP. Um, if, it's, uh, if, if, the, if the patient is not sure, then I don't think it matters. Just mention it to both. Um, and then the, the good doctor will be able to direct it, uh, it you know, accordingly. Okay. So having SLE, um, how do I know or find out the extent of the damage as a whole to sort of like my kidneys, lungs, heart? Is that through an appointment with a rheumatologist? Or? Yeah. Yes. So at the appointment, um, blood tests, a history will be taken, that, which is the first thing. And if there is uh, a, a specific symptom that relates to an organ system, then that would highlight that and require investigation. But part of the investigations would be also blood tests, which you would pick up narrow problems, such as a low white count or low platelet count. It would pick up kidney involvement. It would pick up if there was any liver or muscle involvement. Um, and then, you know, the doctor would do a chest x-ray, lung function tests, an ECG, an echo for the heart, um, a renal ultrasound, uh, a brain scan, depending on what the history and the examination would suggest. If it was kidney involvement, you'd definitely want to know what the blood pressure was, you'd want to know what was in the urine, and you want to know what the blood biochemistry showed. And ultimately, maybe even a renal biopsy. Okay. Um, if it was the lungs, then you might want to do um, chest X-ray, lung function tests, and then HRCT, high resolution lung scan. Okay, thank you. So what are some of the signs that you're about to go into a flare? Or is that again different with everybody? It's different with everybody. But um, it could be that you begin to feel unwell and fatigued. Um, weight loss, uh, temperature, hair loss, increase in rash, pleuritic chest pain, um, waking up at night to pass urine, shortness of breath. Um, yeah, I think fatigue, um, rash, uh, fever are very suggestive of active inflammation. It certainly is in me. That's that they're the, the main ones for myself when I start going into a flare. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, what can we do nutrition-wise to help us manage our lupus more effectively and avoid triggering a flare? Did you say in uh, what nutrition-wise? Uh, nutrition. Um, yeah. Um, Nutrition is the one thing, obviously, that the patient can control. So, uh, you know, having some form of locus of control is really important because um, so much of what happens to a lupus patient is done to them and out of their control, which is awful. Um, uh, you know, either by the disease or by the doctors or investigations or the drugs. Um, and so nutrition is the one thing that that the client or the patient can control. And that's really important. Um, so obviously a good healthy diet is important. Um, if there is anemia, sometimes it's complex. It might be an anemia of chronic disease or iron deficiency or folate deficiency. So certainly having a good intake of iron, folic acid, vitamin B12 is important. Um, a diet high in, um, um, uh, good lipids um, 
uh, high density lipids or fish oils, omega-3 is really helpful. Um, a diet high in vitamin D is important because vitamin D is needed for the immune system, it's needed for bone health. And very often people with lupus are, you know, have been on steroids, so their, their bone density might be low. Uh, and also they use lots of sunblock, so they're not getting natural ultraviolet light, vitamin D. So vitamin D supplementation is really important. I saw one of your um, uh, 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 lupus patients asked about lupus um, vitamins, Lupavite, I think, yeah. which I was looking, I'm not familiar with it, but I was looking at it and it, it looks like a very useful um, supplement. It's got high dose vitamin D in it. It's also got vitamin C, vitamin B12. And then it's got a number of nutritional supplements such as turmeric, ginger, selenium, vitamin E, um, cherry extract. Those are all good. Well, that's good. Too. Yeah. I haven't yeah. over either. No, I, I hadn't. I think it's a, it might be American, but um, I, I'm not suggesting you buy it, but I'm suggesting that all those supplements are important. Fantastic. <coughs> so potassium levels, how important is it to keep those up? Being a yeah. I don't think that's the patient. I think that's the doctor. Okay. Um, potassium is a dangerous element to be playing with. Okay. I think... Um, it can go down if you are taking diuretics and it can be high if the blood sample has been left lying around or if the patient is on drugs such as spironolactone or potassium preserving um, diuretics or certain blood pressure treatments such as the ACE inhibitors. I, I would probably leave the potassium management to the doctor. Fantastic, good to know. So that's questions from me. Coffee. Can lupus patients drink it or not? Yes, they can. But, you know, the answer to that is obviously in moderation. So if a lupus patient has got particular issues with sleep, yep. um, then I would definitely not recommend having tea, coffee or caffeine, you know, after lunchtime. But, you know, one or two coffees a day is perfectly all right. Okay. You know, obviously there's idiosyncratic um, reactions to things. So if you find that coffee makes you feel unwell, and some people do, they get agitated or palpitations or diarrhea, then obviously avoid it. But there's no scientific evidence that coffee is a bad thing Great. for in moderation for lupus. Fantastic. So we've touched on supplements briefly about lupavita and the, the sort of how they can add into the system the things that we're sort of short of as lupus patients. Are there any other sort of supplements or vitamins that you think we should take or is that again down to sort of the doctor's suggestion? Yeah, probably, but I do think vitamin D is really important. So I'd come back to that. You know, a lot of the sunblocks do prevent ultraviolet conversion of vitamin D in the skin. And, vitamin, and, and patients with um, lupus um, do have many reasons why they might have a lower bone density. Okay. Um, they might have concomitant thyroid disease, or they might have been nutritionally deficient, or not absorbing vitamin D, or steroids, etc. So, I, and, and vitamin D is also important for muscle health. So I think, you know, taking around 2,000 international units of vitamin D, or 50 micrograms a day, is probably important. Good. So you mentioned bone density there. Is that something, obviously there's a bone density test, is that something that you would arrange if you thought that was necessary? Or is that something that we should be asking the doctor about? I think you could ask the doctor about it. But I think if the lupus patient is on steroids or weaning off steroids and needs a decision made on whether they still need bone treatment, then that would be the time to do it. Okay, fantastic. If you're a lupus patient and you're not on steroids and you've got a normal diet and you're pre-menopausal, I don't think there's much role for the bone density. Good, fantastic. So what are your thoughts on the connection between lupus and TH cells, especially as it relates to supplements? The data, the data that's out there isn't very conclusive. It isn't conclusive. There are lots and lots of different parts of the immune system which can be moderated or affected by 
dietary things. Uh, and the T cells, the T helper cells, are just one of them. But there are many others. I, I think I wouldn't specifically go into that because I'm not sure it's that helpful. That's fine. So is it safe to become pregnant with lupus? And are the medications that we take safe enough to take while you're in early pregnancy? Yeah, that's a good question. Because obviously lupus is a, uh, predominantly a female disease, nine females to one male. Um, and so, and it also lupus is usually a disease which affects fertile women or, or the age when you might be thinking of pregnancy. And so it's very important to think about that because the drugs can have a negative effect on pregnancy and the lupus itself can have a negative effect on lupus, or on pregnancy. So the first thing to say is pregnancy is not out of the question. It's very definitely something that every lupus patient should feel comfortable asking their doctor about and should um, hopefully be able to do uh, if they want to do it. Um, it is um, not safe to embark on a pregnancy if your lupus is very, very active and inflamed. So the ideal is to try and get your lupus into remission as much as you possibly can. Um, there are certain drugs that are completely safe in pregnancy. Steroids in low doses are. Uh, hydroxychloroquine is safe in pregnancy. Azathioprine is safe in pregnancy. Methotrexate is not. Mycophenolate is not. Um, cyclophosphamide is not. And so it's very much about managing the issues. Um, there are some, part, some aspects of lupus which need to be taken into account in planning the pregnancy. So planning pregnancy is really important. Making sure the pregnant woman is on folate supplementation and as healthy as they possibly could be. Knowing whether they are Rho positive, which is an antibody, may be important because in a very rare subgroup of people who are Rho positive, you can get congenital heart problems in the infant. So that needs to be taken into account. But again, it's not a reason not to get pregnant. Uh, and if they are antiphospholipid antibody or anticardiolipid and antibody positive, that's important to know because there is a risk of miscarriage. Um, but having said all that, um, being pregnant and be having lupus is fine. It just needs to be planned and thought about. Yeah, that's really nice to know. And I, and I would certainly work very closely with the um, obstetric physicians. Um, and, and we have lupus pregnancy clinics. Fantastic. So what is the interaction with hormonal contraceptives such as a monthly injection with lupus patients? Yeah, that's it. From going from pregnancy to hormones is quite a good segue. Um, so there is very definitely a hormonal influence in, in, in lupus. Um, and estrogen uh, is known to be an immune modulating hormone and can have an effect. And that's why nine to one female to male um, as well. So pregnancy can affect lupus. Uh, it can get worse in pregnancy, the lupus can. Um, uh, the uh, combined uh, contraceptive can and uh, HRT can also affect lupus. However, that's not to say those drugs are contraindicated in lupus. It very much depends on the type of lupus. If the lupus patient is antiphospholipid antibody positive, in other words, they've got these particular antibodies associated with clotting, then I would avoid estrogen containing treatment. Okay. But the progesterone pill, the mini pill, the, IE, the intrauterine device, those are fine. Great. So it appears to be quite common um, for lupus patients to feel their hands and feet either really warm or really cold. Why is this? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I mean, lupus is a vascular disease as well. It affects the small blood vessels. It affects circulation. So the more common one is Raynaud's when the hands go white, blue, or then deep red um, and uncomfortable. 
Um, so it's a vasospastic disorder. The small blood vessels go into spasm. Okay. Uh, and so the lupus patient might feel cold um, peripherally. But you can also feel cold if you're unwell. You know, if you've got a slight fever, if you're under the weather, if your thyroid is slightly underactive, you might feel cold. Okay. Um, in contrast, if your skin is very inflamed, if you've got a classic butterfly rash, etc., um, uh, or if you're perimenopausal, you might feel hot and you might want to take off you know, clothes and be hot. So you do get those variations in temperature. Okay. So is being tachycardic something to be concerned about as a lupus patient? The GP knows about it, but the rheumatologist, rheumatologist doesn't. Should he be informed? Yeah. So tachycardia means a fast pulse. Okay. Um, and it doesn't um, mean that there's something definitely wrong, okay. but it, it does mean that it needs to be looked at and investigated. It also depends on how fast, because some people um, might um, bring their heart rate up to about 110 just because they're anxious. Okay. Uh, or they're out of breath, or they've just run for a bus. Um, so, it, or they might be on... It might be very slow if they're on a beta blocker. So it very much depends on what's going on. If you are, um, if you're anemic, your blood, your heart rate will be faster. Okay. If you're on some blood pressure treatments like B, um, nifedipine, your heart rate might be faster. Um, if your thyroid is overactive, it might be fast. So it very much depends on what's going on. Um, obviously, the more sinister causes of heart, fast heart rate might be because your heart muscle is affected. I would say that's less likely. Okay, but let the rheumatologist know and let them check it out for you. Yeah. Eat, drinking lots of coffee could be a cause of heart. <laughs> yeah. um, so why does hair loss happen with lupus and how can we slow it down? Why does hair loss? Hair loss, yeah. Um, again, multifactorial. So hair loss could be seasonal. Some okay. people lose hair, you know, when it gets very hot or whatever, just like animals molt. Um, it could be that um, their thyroid is underactive, or it could be that they're having a flare of their disease when the hair loss does happen. Um, Hair loss could be autoimmune, certainly if it occurs in patches or whatever, that would be uh, important. Steroids can cause hair loss, and certainly the chemotherapy drugs, methotrexate, azathioprine, mycophenolate, cyclophosphamide, can all cause hair loss. So I'd say multifactorial. As hydroxychloroquine can also do it, actually. So it very much depends on what's going on and why, what drugs the patient's on, how active their disease is, is there anything else that's causing it. So how can we treat fatigue and lupus? I know fatigue is one of the main symptoms for myself and quite a lot of people that I know. So what can we do to sort of help diminish that as much as possible? So fatigue is a really difficult symptom to treat. And um, you may have perfect lupus control and still feel fatigued. And it's the same in rheumatoid. Um, fatigue is a very common symptom. Um, having said that, it is also multifactorial. So, for example, if you've got poor quality, non-restorative sleep, um, uh, uh, you may have fatigue all the time. And some people with, rheum with rheumatoid or lupus will have fibromyalgia. So, um, fatigue could be very much part of sleep hygiene. Okay. Steroids can be associated with poor quality sleep and fatigue. Um, but steroids could also do the reverse. They could make you a bit hyper. Um, so lots of different reasons. Some drugs make you feel fatigued. Um, you know, some drugs are given for sleep, like amitriptyline or for pain, and they can make you feel fatigued. Um, I think the most important thing is to tell the doctor about it, and then the doctor will check are, is the patient anemic? Is the, are they underactive thyroid? Are they on drugs that could be perpetuating the fatigue? Some antidepressants can do it. Um, but, you know, sometimes at the end of the day, there isn't 
yeah. and reason. Uh, and it's also important in lupus and in the autoimmune connective tissue diseases to focus on aerobic fitness. Okay. Because one of the big things when you've got a chronic disease is you don't exercise or one doesn't exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, a graded exercise program is really important. Doing a little bit of excess aerobic fitness every day is helpful and that will reduce fatigue. The other reason for fatigue is mood. You know, are, is there low level depression or anxiety present? And that's important. You know, some people might not actually recognize that they're feeling depressed. They might have physical symptoms of depression, such as um, feeling, um, yeah, just feeling, you know, slight diarrhea, aches and pains, not wanting to go out, not wanting to socialize, um, you know, things like that. So it's, well, that's important to explore. Is it quite common for lupus patients to sort of have issues with depression and anxiety and things? That it's very common, very, very common. And it's really important to recognise. It's important to talk about. There's no stigma attached to it. And sometimes having some form of psychological outlet or not necessarily psychotherapy, but um, a, somebody to talk to. Um, is really important with lupus. You know, it's like, it's not fair. Why have I, you know, why have I got this? Why am I taking these drugs? Why am I taking something that's making me put on weight and have side effects? Why am I different? Um, and also, it's, you know, we talked, you talked about anxiety and depression. I mean, anger is also important. Mm -hmm. You know, the patient may be very, maybe pissed off. You know, why have I I'm got this? Yeah. I, I don't need this. Um, it's not fair. So that's all very, very important to talk about and explore with your doctor, with a friend, with a psychotherapist or, you know, the rheumatologist. Or, you know, in fact, groups like yours. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, because it's, it's one of these things that I probably never had, would have said I had an issue with depression or anxiety until this last seven months. Mm. And it's got me overthinking everything and sort of going back to sort of my diagnosis and why can't I do that and things. So, yeah, groups like Lupus and I or the other groups that are out there, it's good to know that you're not alone. And actually absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, I would say that it would be abnormal not to have an emotional reaction to having this diagnosis. If, if I have a lupus patient that says to me, oh, no, 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 I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm not depressed, I'm not anxious, I'm not anything, I'd say, what, are you a robot? You know, we all have an emotional world and we all will have uh, emotional responses to things. Mm -hmm. And if you tell me that you don't feel anxious when you go to the doctor and you're waiting to get your blood test results, I'd say that's not normal. So it's totally understandable and it is normal. Nice to know. I would be very surprised if somebody with a chronic illness does not feel some anxiety about seeing the doctor, hearing their blood results, having the diagnosis, taking these drugs that they don't want to be taking, etc. Great, thank you. So you've already mentioned sunscreen um, earlier on in the conversation, but how important is it that we wear it on a daily basis? So it is important. Ultraviolet is known to cause changes in the immune cells within the skin, which can be associated with a flare. Obviously, in some lupus patients, it happens more than in others. And lupus is such a, what we call heterogeneous disease. In other words, presents in so many different ways to different, in different people. You can have a hundred people with lupus who will all look completely different. But, um, uh, sunscreen, I think, is important, and it's important to use a high uh, SPF or solar protection factor. And I would say factor 50 is probably appropriate. You don't need factor 100. There's not much difference between 50 and 100. 50 is good enough. Um, uh, so I think it is important, and you can get that factor 50 or, or um, uh, sunscreen incorporated in a, in a daily moisturizer. It doesn't have to be that you just use the sunblock. You can, you can incorporate these in, in various other makeup preparations. Fantastic.
So what impact is the current situation sort of COVID-19, what impact is that having on some like people with lupus sort of in terms of if they were to catch COVID, how serious would it be? Yeah. Okay, so the first thing I'd say about COVID uh, is it's making everyone feel anxious. Yeah. Um, and that's normal. Um, everyone's feeling stressed about it. Um, it's affecting um, families, it's affecting sleep, it's affecting relationships, it's affecting dating, it's affecting you know, loads of aspects of our social life because we are social animals. Um, and it's very stressful. Yeah. Um, but um, for people with inflammatory rheumatic disease, there's the added worry. In other words, will my disease make me more susceptible? And will the treatment I'm on make me more vulnerable? And if I get COVID, will I be worse off? Yeah. And I'd like to reassure you that on all those levels, it would be, it's not true. So the evidence thus far in rheumatoid and in juvenile arthritis, etc., is that those patients with those inflammatory diseases do not get, do not get COVID worse off, okay. worse than anyone else. People who suffer COVID worse, in other words, have a greater incidence of serious consequences and or death, are those patients who are older, you know, age is a big risk, Okay. Um, and comorbidities such as diabetes, um, heart disease, pulmonary emboli, um, and BAME groups. Um, but if you're just a, if you're a straightforward young lupus patient on a small amount of azathioprine or hydroxychloroquine, there's no real reason that you'll be much worse off. So I would reassure you on that. Obviously, social distancing. Uh, wearing a mask, washing your hands, sanitizing, etc., is vital. But I think this specific diagnosis of lupus doesn't necessarily make you much more vulnerable. But you know, we need to take each case in its own right. Obviously, if there's lots of things going on and the person's had clots and diabetes and high doses of steroid, then obviously they're going to be worse off. That's but the general straightforward lupus, no. Great. So final question, um, what research has currently been done into lupus just now? So loads of, loads of research. So there's both quantitative quality and qualitative research, you know. So on the qualitative side, how people are managing, how they're relating, and what effect it's had on work, on employment, on social interactions, depression, mood, etc. So there's all that. And then there's obviously loads of research into drugs, drug trials. And then there's loads of research into the genetics and into the disease mechanisms. So into B cells, T cells, complement deficiencies, um, et cetera. And also research into finding an adequate disease activity marker. So that's quite difficult as well. You know, how do we judge and research how active the lupus is, and their various scoring systems, BILAG, SLEDI, et cetera. So there's research in many, many different aspects of lupus, um, loads going on all the time. In my department alone, we've got lots of basic science research, particularly looking at B cells and T cells, but many other units are looking at drug trials. That's good to know that they are still looking into it and that the research is going to continue, which hopefully will hmm bring change for those with lupus? I hope so, I hope so. I mean, it's very definitely a different disease now to manage than it was when I first started looking after lupus patients many years ago. It has, because when you think about it, it's not been that long a time period, but the changes have been quite significant, haven't they? And, and that's right, and the biological treatments, the monoclonal antibody treatments, um, have revolutionized the management of severe lupus. You know, rituximab, um, which is a B cell blocker, and belumimab have, have, you know, are really helpful new drugs. And there's loads of new uh, monoclonal antibodies on the horizon. Amazing. And those drugs are what we call targeted treatments specifically for the immune system that's, um, that's dysfunctional. 
And so therefore the broad side effects that one sees with drugs such as azathioprine, mycophenolate, methotrexate, will be much, much less because the treatment will be targeted at a very specific part of the immune system. Amazing, that sounds really, really good. So thank you very much for taking your time out of your Saturday morning today. Um, I've learned quite a lot today, which is really nice to actually be able to sit down and talk to somebody like yourself and just ask the questions that are on our minds. So thank you very much for that. Um, it's my pleasure. Anytime.